Women who are ovulating prefer men with thicker jaws So for example, if you show women pictures of the same men across their menstrual cycle And all you do is widen the jaw The narrow-jawed guy is more preferable when there's less probability of conception And the wider-jawed guy is, is uh, more, more desirable when the pro probability of ovulation is high And jaw dimensions are associated at least to some degree with aggression Why would that be? Why would that be? Because it's for biting You know, like think about animals, they bite, you know, and human beings can bite too So, the, the jaw, the relationship between jaw dimension and disagreeableness, say, seems to have It's a somewhat of a hangover from our evolutionary past Women have a higher proportion of body fat Women are more resistant to diseases that's a good deal for women. They live longer. That's a good deal, too. There's way more male homicide victims, which seems spectacularly unfair until you notice that there are many more male homicide perpetrators, which then seems to sort of even things out. Um, <laughs> men kill non-intimate acquaintances or strangers 80% of the time, where women kill intimate partners or family members <laughs> 60% of the time. Of course, they're doing it a lot less frequently. So, and you never know how many of those are in something approximating desperation and self-defense, right? Uh, excluding the odd psychopathic woman. In some animals, sexual dimorphism is how much difference there is in the morphology between a male of the species and a female of the species. And there can be a lot, like with elephant seals, for example, the males are like ten times bigger than the females. And usually in a situation like that, the male has a harem. So, there's extreme male reproductive success on the part of a couple of males and then extreme male failure among the rest of them So, there some, seems to be some relationship between lack of sexual dimorphism and monogamy among mammals So, the, the less dimorphic uh, an, uh, a species is, the more likely they are to pair bond And human beings are relatively non-dimorphic so, we're a little more dimorphic than the typical monogamous animal, but a little less dimorphic than the typical um, polygamous animal And the gender differences, these sorts of gender differences, with the male being larger and more aggressive than the female Are not characteristic of all mammals, although they're characteristic of many of them So, the one, the major, the major um, exception are hyenas And the hyena females are very testosteroneized, and they're very, if that's a word they're very much, they have very high levels of testosterone and they're slightly larger than the males and they are more aggressive But the price they pay for that is that their reproductive organs mimic the penis and that's what they have to give birth through So it isn't exactly clear that that's a... An <laughs> I'm not sure that's an advantage Okay, well, so, so here are some of the differences between men and women So you can see there's a 5 inch difference in height, a 30 pound difference in weight um, men are about 40 to 60 percent stronger in their upper body and about 70 to 75 oh, Sorry, that's wrong Women are 40 to 60 percent as strong as men in upper body strength and 70 to 75 percent in terms of, low, uh, of lower body strength Okay, so back to these, construction, forestry, mining, utilities Well, you can kind of see, maybe, that these are jobs, you can tell me if you disagree, but these seem to me to be jobs that might require more physical strength, that would certainly be the case in forestry and mining and construction and likely in utility work too, so and then there are also thing-like jobs, right? so these aren't, you know there's not a lot of <laughs> value on fostering close human relationships in these sorts of occupations, you know so so here, here's some interesting things. Ten most do male-dominated occupations in the U.S. So I guess one of the things that you might ask yourself is, um, do, would you be interested in a job like this? So, hypothetically, men are more interested in jobs like this than women. Brick mason, block mason, stone mason, so, you know, carving up stone. Cement masons, electrical power line installers and repairers. That's a tough job, eh? Be very hard to do that, like during the ice storm, that'd be a hard job. Carpet floor and tile installers, heating, air conditioning, refrigeration mechanics, structure iron and rebar workers, 
bus and truck mechanics and diesel engine specialists, miscellaneous vehicle and mobile equipment mechanics, tool and die makers, and roofers. So, and those are overwhelmingly male, right? If you look on the right-hand column there, there isn't even 1% of the, the total number of, of women in those occupations isn't even 1%. You know, it's funny, you don't, you don't hear a lot of, like, gender affirmative action calls for structure, iron, and rebar worker gender equality. So, which, well, I think that's interesting, you know, if it's, if it's merely a matter of gender inequality, then why does it differ, why, what difference does it make what the category of employment is? That sort of argument shouldn't be reserved for only the upper echelons and the most desirable jobs, you know, otherwise, that's not a coherent argument, it either applies across the spectrum of jobs or it's incoherent, those are the alternatives. So, here's the 10 most female dominated occupations in the US. It's still, secretaries and administrative assistants. Now, you know, that was the most common female job in the 1950s, and it is still overwhelmingly the most common female job. So that's quite interesting, and although it's incredibly dominated by women. So, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's like, it's not that easy to tell. Childcare workers, well, that doesn't really come as much of a surprise, but it is, it is notable. And one of the things you see in the Scandinavian countries, for example, it's pretty much related to this, is that there's a, in this, in, there's a 20 to 1 difference, men versus women, in engineering, and there's a 20 to 1 women versus men difference in nursing. So, and it's, the Scandinavian governments every now and then go through a fit of, of enthusiasm about attracting more women into engineering, and so they, you know, crank up their social engineering and their and their information about how desirable a profession that is, and then the proportion of women who go into engineering rises slightly, not very much, and then as soon as they stop, you know, pushing it hard, it just drops right back down to 5%. Teacher assistants, registered nurses, bookkeeping, accounting and auditing clerks, maid and housekeeping cleaners, nursing, psychiatric and home health aides, personal and home care aides, and general office clerks. So that's where the bulk of women are in the that's where the bulk of the female dominated occupations are so let's see now did I cover all those things yeah I did so here's I've been trying to figure this out for a long time like what this agreeableness thing is and, and this is sort of what I've concluded because um, I'm always interested in tying this down to the biology and Jak Panksepp who's a very good neuroscientist has identified a number of fundamental biological emotional systems um, some of which we've alluded to already and some of which we really haven't so for example it was Panksepp who identified the existence of a play system um, for engaging for example in, in rough and tumble play and that seems to be something that males prefer more than females prefer but he's also identified a care system and you could think about that as the basic it, it, there has to be a care system I mean for God's sake we're mammals right I mean the definition of a a mammal is, well, first, the mammal is warm-blooded and has hair, but the next part of it is that the mammal is fed breast milk. And so, obviously, there's a dependent relationship there. And it's not only a, like, it's a dependent relationship, and it's a difficult dependent relationship. You know, like, children are very, um, not able to care for themselves for a very long period of time. I, I don't remember if I mentioned to you this or not, but a mammal of our size should carry an infant for two years, gestation. So you should be pregnant for two years. And then the baby would be born and would be, you know, good for something. Walk around and so on, like, like many mammals can as soon as they're born. But because our heads are so big, and because women's hips have to be narrow enough so that they can run, there's an evolutionary arms race between these structures in some sense. And so what's happened is that, you know, women compromise by having wider hips, and babies compromise by having heads that can be... be compressed during childbirth and also by being born much earlier but the price that's paid for that is that they're incredibly dependent and so so you think well there has to be well it's foolish to even argue otherwise people fall in love with their baby, babies to a staggering degree and the typical response of new parents is, well, I never knew it would be like this, because even if you're not interested in someone else's baby, you tend to be unbelievably interested in your own baby. And that's a good thing, because 
they're a lot of trouble and so there's a system, a maternal system primarily, a care system it's, it's a system that's shared by men because men are also very maternal for mammals and so I believe that's on the one end of the agreeableness spectrum it's like the maternal care system is what's driving empathy and sympathy and all of those things and you know I, I think actually that it was the it was the expansion of the maternal care system to include men that actually resulted in human beings capability to pair bond because one of the things that's really weird about people is that they share food because animals aren't very good at that, like chimps will do it a little bit but they're not too happy about it, and wolves sort of look like they share food, but that isn't really what happens the dominant ones just eat till they're full, and then they don't mind if, you know, the subordinate ones eat what's left over but human beings will share food now, of course, female mammals often share food with their infants, but they don't generally share food with, you know, their, their compatriot and, you know, you, you think about all the... think about the language that couples who are in love use to each other you know, there's a real infantile element to it it's baby and deer and, you know, they make little cooing noises and they give each other little pet names and, like, there's something that's, that's like... There, there's, there's a juvenile element to it that, that seems to me to be a consequence of the activation of this care system you know, between adults rather than from the adult to the child 